Um, okay, these are movable and dockable toolbars. So if I move over to the corner or to the side and, you know, click on this bar, I can drag it. And, you know, sometimes you have to catch it just right to move it. But I can move these into different positions, you know, and dock them into different locations so I can save more space. Or if you find that you're not really using one of them all the time, you can just turn it off. But um, this is your color chart. And if it happens to turn off, not a big deal. It opens up as well. Under view, okay? Mm -hmm. And so do all of your toolbars. If you lose a toolbar, just go to view and toolbar, and you're going to see, you know, all of your toolbars. If they have a check mark, then, you know, of course, that they're turned on, right? Right. Except for this one, which is the resequence viewer. Let's see if I can drag this out again. Of course, you know, when I didn't have the recording thing on, I could drag these things anywhere and they worked perfectly, but <laughs> <laughs> you know how that goes, right? Here is yeah. um, your resequence viewer, and you know, every once in a while you, it gets turned off. And this is a tool that you're going to want to use, especially if you're combining designs or you're adding lettering or you're changing colors. So if you lose that resequence viewer that was over here, you know, don't panic. Just go up to Edit and Resequence. Okay, it's the only one that's not in the view menu. So I'm going to go ahead and just move this back over here. And if I drag it and kind of overlap it, then it redocks to, um, you know, the frame of the program. Okay, now when you install your Digitizer Junior program, the first thing that you need to do is go to your setup. In the setup, there's an option called screen calibration. Okay, do you see how on the screen my squares are not perfectly square. They're a little rectangular. Well, if I want a real one-to-one -one view of a design and I don't want it to look kind of stretched out, especially on the larger monitors, I'm going to go to Setup and Screen Calibration. And when this little window opens, then you measure with a tape measure across the width and then the height of it. And I happen to know mine is like 90 and 57. And you measure, you know, you enter that measurement in, and then you just say, okay, now, unless you have changed your Windows program, this is going to show inches here. And, okay. and I'll explain to you how you can change your program as well, okay? I like to work in millimeters because it is just so much easier to, um, yeah, yours, Terry, your, your measurements are probably going to show in inches when you open that, but... Mine are showing in millimeters, and I'll show you how I set it that way. The reason I like to work in millimeters is that it's so much easier. Um, for example, when you have, um, you know, like stitch density, it's 0.4, generally matches up pretty close to your standard thread, right? If you're in inches, that density setting I think is like 0.16 and a whole lot of trailing digits. It's not as precise as 0.4. Okay, and it's also a lot harder to kind of maybe understand what the actual setting is or to easily adjust it. So if you work in millimeters, then, you know, it's so much easier. 0.4 is your standard density. 0.5 is, you know, a little thicker. 0.3 is, you know, a little less, you know, dense, okay? And, you know, it also has to do with some stitch lengths and your hoop sizes. Um, for example, you know, up here, you know, I'm going to pick kind of my machine, right? And if I happen to pick by, you know, the way the 11,000, um, I'm going to have some options to pick different hoops. And over here, I can select the hoop for my machine. See these settings? Whether I'm in inches or millimeters, you know, these settings are the same they're millimeters. Your hoop sizes are in millimeters. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little bit easier. It's a little more precise. And it's not like you have to learn the metric system. You really don't. All you have to do is pretty much know some basic settings like your density setting and the size of your hoop. Does that make sense, Terry? Okay, now I'm working in millimeters, but um, how I got this setting and if your, you know, program is set in millimeters, you know, and you really want to go back to inches, you go to start, and then you're going to hunt down your control panel. And if your control panel doesn't look like this, it may look something similar to this. 
don't worry, just come over and switch to Classic View. And what you're going to look for is going to be your regional and um, language settings. And it's generally a globe. When you so this you have to change in, in the control panel instead of through the program. Right. And now when you change this, if you want to go to millimeters or, you know, you want to change back from millimeters, it's not going to change any of the measurements in your other programs. At least, uh, I'll put it to you this way, I've not found one that it's changed except for <laughs> this program, right? So, you know, you click on your regional and language options. And when you come in here, you should have English, you know, and you're going to click on the Customize button. And in the Customize button at the very bottom is a measurement system. And you have the option of U.S. or metric. And that's why I changed my system over to metric. I went in and I selected metric instead of U.S. And I just find that the metric system... Um, or at least the, the numbers for the metric system work so much better for embroidery than the U.S. system. There's just too many digits involved in the U.S. system. So that's how you change it either to metric or, you know, away from metric. And then, of course, you just click OK and OK and apply it. OK, and that's kind of how, you know, I did that. Now, you probably won't remember all of that, but don't worry because you're going to get a video of this um, tomorrow after it's done processing so you can review it but I will warn you it's going to come in a link so you can download it and it's it's quite large it's usually about 160 megabytes but it plays in Windows Media Player and I've not had anybody say that they can't watch it so um, after you download it it's on your computer and you just double click on it and you can pause it and you can fast forward through it okay now um, let me move the control panel out of the way for a second what I did here was in this toolbar, this is going to be your basic standard toolbar. So you've got, you know, your new, open, save, you know, print, which is, of course, to print a template, print preview, and then, of course, cut, copy, paste. And then you have this, which is going to ask you, what machine do you have? Now, are you guys both working on the Elna version? I am, yes. Okay, and Terry, I know, has the Elna version. Okay, you won't see MC11000. You'll see um, Elna 9600, Elna 9500, Elna 8300, right? And you're going to pick what machine you have. The 11000 um, is the same hoop size as, as the um, 95 and 9600, okay? Terry, or um, Linda, in your case, do you have the new machine or do you still have your exquisite? I have the exquisite, too. Okay, you can actually click on other and put your hoop sizes in or, or just select other. And the reason you would do that is because, um, you know, you can come over here and there's hoop number one, select a different hoop for your machine. And, you know, you can, you know, I'm trying to think how to describe it. If you select other, it doesn't save that genome hoop information for you. Does that make sense? Okay. okay. Yep. And if you run into a problem, honestly, um, you're not going to have any problems if you save it on, like, the 10,001 or even the 11,000 and you select the um, 140 by 200 hoop, okay? Your okay. exquisite hoop is 240 by 140. Okay. Two, so it's a little bit taller, okay? So this is where you pick your machine type and the reason is is because as soon as you pick that over here you're going to be able to pick what hoop you want to use okay and Terry you are going to have all of the hoops that go with the 11,000 because you have the 9500 so you're going to have all of these hoops except um, the AQ and ASQ hoops and unless you've purchased the hat hoop you may not have that as well but so that you know um, I wouldn't go back to the dealer that you went to, to be honest, but um, I did send over, I think on the Yahoo group, another dealer that's in your area. You can upgrade your 9500 to all of the new fe features of the 9600, which in includes like an AccuFill feature for quilting right on the machine and um, some additional stitches from Elna, you know, just so you know that. So... Um, let me kind of move this bar over so I can see it all. You know, so 
check with you know the dealer and see if that's something that you might want to do. I don't know what the upgrade fee is. You would need to contact the dealer, and you know if you find that 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 dealer's not you know one that you're comfortable with, um, you know let me know. There's there are a lot of Elna dealers. You just may have to call one and and talk to you know one that's a little ways away and see what they can do. See, Bernie, I, I tell you, I tell you what, I'm truly looking for is you know the best program for whether it be Elna or Genome. I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, Elna is in town. In Des Moines is where they're having the quilt show this weekend. Oh, right, and, right, right, right. And every everybody's in town this weekend. Genome, Elna, everybody. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like I don't know who I should be going to to even get direction right now. Um, the the Elna dealer that's at the Des Moines show is Metro Sewing. She's also a Genome dealer. But Elna reps are all here. Um, yeah, the Elna, actually I'm not sure which reps out there for Elna, uh -huh. but I mean the, the, they're in the Elna booth with them basically. Um, the Elna educators will be out there. Now, it, it depends on who's in the booth. None of them know the exquisite. Don't they? No. No. I was afraid of that. <laughs> yeah, none of them know the exquisite. So now, with that being said, the owner of Metro Sewing retired and her daughter took over. And her daughter's pretty pretty savvy. So she might be actually more help to you than any one of the educators could be on the exquisite right now. Okay. And uh, you know, she's a pretty sharp little cracker. So, and Terry saying she was at the Des Moines show last year and it was very good. Yeah, I kind of, I miss not being out there there this year and I kind of thought about going. I thought, eh, you know. So, <laughs> You know, it's wonderful. You know, I, I'm always impressed. I'm so yeah, impressed. it's fun to kind of go and look at things. And, um, you know, so and when when we get to the end of the webinar, um, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys in on something. But you know, in the meantime, okay. we'll kind of start going through this. Okay, we've got, you know, you kind of understand the hoops. It's a little different than what you're used to in the exquisite because it's just very click and very visual. And something to kind of tuck in the back of your mind because you have that, you know, expressive software. When you, at some point, that expressive software is not going to be updated again. It's good through Vista and a 64-bit system right now. But when you do go to look at updating to another digitizing system, um, I highly recommend the Digitizer EX or, you know, if you go to a Genome dealer, Digitizer Pro MB, okay? It is um, from a commercial company called Wilcom. It's one of the best software systems out there. Not that the expressive system isn't good. The expressive system, you know, is good. It's just, you know, at some point you're going to hit a wall with it. And, yeah. you know, Terry, with this, um, depending on what you want to do, I, I don't know how much experience you have on digitizing. I kind of know what Linda has because she's been in other webinars. But, you know, starting out with Digitizer Junior is a good way to start and then kind of grow into the digitizing package. Now, one advantage you'll have if you understand this system, if you do update it, A, you don't pay the full price for, you know, the full system again, and B, you'll already understand how the other system works, you know, like the upgrade system. So, with you know, we've kind of covered, like, the little interface, and you guys know to calibrate your screen, which you have to do on, you know, every program, right? And I've kind of explained some of these little you know, toolbars a little bit, but we're going to cover these toolbars as we go through some things. There's some really neat, okay, Terry revamps, okay, so if you ever decide, like, you really want to, you know, get into digitizing, then, you know, really, you've already got a chunk of the system, if that makes sense. It's like, you know, when you go to buy, um, now I'm trying to think of something to equate it to, I know there's stuff out there, right? And when you, you know, you buy something that you can kind of piecemeal and you've already got a big hunk of it. That's kind of what you have with Digitizer Junior. Okay, so now this has some really neat features. If we go to the setup, you can see you have a work environment, so you can kind of set the color of your hoop and you can, you know, set the color of the backgrounds and you can, you know, make some changes to things. And that's kind of standard with everything, so we're not going to cover all of that. Um, you can set your work area, which is something that, we're going to cover in one of the other web webinars, which is this ability to lay out this huge design and then print the templates that will tell you what order to stitch it in and allow you to line it up, um, even if you just have a little hoop, right? OK, 
Okay, Choose Fabric. This is one of the really nice features. If you click on Choose Fabric, you have this little box that comes up and it gives you all of these options. You know, chiffon, eight of cloth, corduroy, you know, and if you see when I'm clipping on these, or clicking on these down here, it's saying requires stabilizer. Well, these are like guidelines for you. You know, start off with these, right? Um, for crepe, it's saying um, a topping, you know, there's nothing there, backing, lightweight, tearaway. Okay, well, use these as a guideline, but bear in mind that if your design has more than seven or 8,000 stitches, you may need a couple layers of lightweight tearaway. But besides giving you these little, you know, required stabilizer hints, what this is doing when I select my fabric is, you know, applying a set of default density, underlay, and stitch settings based on a fabric type. So instead of having to automatically know, what do I need to change the density to? What do I need to change the compensation to? What underlay? You've got this really good base to start with, right? And you might need to make some minor changes, but for the most part, this is pretty good. And all you do is say, okay, I'm going to do hand knits. And there you go. And if you look at the bottom of the screen down here, you can see it is now set for hand knits. Cool. So, you know, it's... um. You know, so um, Terry, or Terry's asking how you set for terry cloth. Well, you would go into Setup and then Choose Fabric. And as you scroll down, you can see that there's Stretch Terry mm -hmm. and then there's Terry Telling. So you would just select which one do you want. And, you know, like I said, it's telling you solvent film and backing. Well, you know, bear in mind, check out your backing, too, because if you have a design that, you know, um, this in this case, did not get down far. Okay, I'm, um, oh, okay, I see what she's saying. You know, in this case, it's telling you tear away. Well, okay, well, if you have a design that has, you know, 50,000 stitches in it, you're going to have a problem because tear aways, you know, like a medium to heavyweight tear away is only going to hold between seven to 8,000 stitches accurately, right? So use these as a starting point, but um, at some point, like as we go through the webinars, we kind of start to cover these backings a little bit more and, you know, I kind of can explain, and if you go on the website, actually, in the um, Ask Us section, there's some information on backing and how many stitches they hold. You can also find that on, like, Fred LeBeau's site. If you search for Fred LeBeau, you can generally find the information because he is very, very knowledgeable about the different types of backings and how many stitches they hold. But anyway, so you kind of select your settings, and you can check down here. You can see what it says. Okay, now also in the setup, you have, you know, your thread colors. You can kind of come in here and you can set your thread colors. Um, you know, Linda knows I'm a Robinson and Anton fan, and I'm also <laughs> and I'm also a rayon girl, right? I'm not real big on poly, and nothing's wrong with poly. It's just a personal preference because it has such rayon has a softer hand, and you know, I'm not doing a lot of um, baby garments that are going under bleach anymore. You know, my stuff maybe hits color safe bleach, right? And rayon holds up very well. So you can come in here and you can select your chart and you can move these colors over here and, you know, just select something and say add it and it adds it to the bottom. Now the default is going to be the Janome colors. You know, you could replace these if you wanted to, but here's how I kind of view the thread chart. Um, first off, you can increase how many threads this is going to see and you can increase it all the way up to 128 colors. My view of a thread chart may be different than, you know, you guys's, but I figure if it looks like gold, I know I'm going to go find the gold color I want. <laughs> I do the same. All right. Some people are very particular. They want the number. They want, you know, and for those people, you have this option. Here you go. All of these, fat, all of these different threads. And... You know, then you can say, okay, I want that one, I want this one, you know, and you can just add your colors here, okay? And when you say, okay, the new colors are going to show up over here. Yeah, see, oh, good, we all get along. We all do our own color thing. We're not, like, tied to those numbers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I I know that there's people that are just very paranoid and have to have that number. Um, I just figure, oh, I know what color green I want to use. 
And then half the time I change my mind anyway because, you know, the screen preview is not always as accurate as, you know, what real life is when you, you know, start putting this against fabric. So anyway, here's how you adjust that color chart. You can add more colors. You can take away colors. You can add specific colors. And, you know, it depends on how much work you want to put into that. Okay, the screen calibration, you know, is what we did when we measured and got our, our grid and our one-to-one -one view set up correctly. Okay, object details we're going to talk about as we go along. And down here on software options, if you do ever choose to upgrade, that is where you will put your new access code in. And instead of you having to reinstall a whole ton of stuff and then fight with getting your dongle recognized or anything like that, it just upgrades your dongle. So your dongle will automatically be upgraded um, with a little code. So every time that you open the program, you have the options that you purchased. All right. So now we're going to go over here, and I'm going to go up. Here's our main menu. We're going to go up to File. And I'm going to go ahead. I can't give you guys this um, design that I'm going to open, but I did want to show you this because it does show the capabilities of the program. Let me see if it will open here. I probably moved it to another folder and it's going, ah, you know. This <laughs> design, <laughs> Linda knows, she's seen my messy hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> this design, so that you know, was created in the Digitizer Junior program using the automatic feature. Okay, now what is on my screen, we're not going to cover this today, but I wanted to show you this, is a very large design. I have one, um, you know, I'm looking at my different hoopings here. One, two, three, four, you know, five, six, seven separate hoopings. And this is all laid out now for me, right? I've basically made my design, laid it out how I want it to be done. And it's quite a large design. So now I would just go and I would print my templates. And you can see what it's doing. Here's, you know, the templates. If I go to the next page, you know, here's some more. And it's got numbers, if you can see them up here. See the numbers, one and then two. Uh -huh. So it's telling me what position to stitch these in. And it's giving me my thread colors and, you know, all those nifty little things that you need. Um, let me go back to the previous page. To be able to stitch out a large design like this. Okay, now this is, in comparison to what I can actually do in the program, a small design layout. So what Digitizer Junior will let me do is lay out this huge design, like for a tablecloth or a bedspread, and print my templates off so I can use these to align the designs perfectly. Okay, that's one of the beauties of this. Um, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see Customizer when it was out. It was, you know, kind of an older program, and Digitizer Junior has replaced it with a lot more function. But Customizer kind of gave you that option, too, but you only had a set size. You had, well, maybe, I think, I'm trying to remember, 300 by 400 or something. You know, this, you can actually keep going until you pretty much run out of computer resources. So it's kind of a nice feature, especially if you're planning something large, okay? So, you know, that's, you know, I just wanted to kind of show you that because we're not going to have time to go through all of that. And I also wanted to show you that this is what you're capable of doing in the program. You can create a design with this much detail using the automation. And, you know, that was nothing special. I basically brought the design in, changed my fill directions, and, you know, click there you go. I had an automatic design. So in the scope of you know, the power of the automatic digitizing in this program, you know, it, it's pretty decent. I was impressed. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. Okay. And I want to show you what you can open. You can open these files. Jan, of course, is going to be your editable file, right? Then, of mm -hmm. course, you have Jeff, Jeff Plus, which is the format on your machine. Then you have SEW, EMD, um, PES, PEC, and, you know, HUS, which is Husqvarna, and then VIP and VP3. Okay, and these are older formats, okay? And you can open commercial formats as well. You've got your DST there. You can open the EMD format, but, you know, Linda, as you know, that, you know, most of the time you're not really saving in the EMD format. You're just writing to the card. Right, right. And that, but so that, you know, if you do have EMD files, you'll be able to open them. 
And I'm trying to think what these are. Oh, these, okay. I'll go ahead and open one of these. Um, these I actually made in the digitizer program. But, um, you know, this is a GAN file. Let me see if I can, you know, this is your visualizer. It's going to give you a 3D preview, these little glasses. This turns my image on or off. You can see the image behind it. This is my grid. You can display the grid or you can turn the grid off. You can display your hoop or you can turn the hoop off. Now when I open this design that was a JAN file, you saw that it opened the 200 by 200 hoop. And that is because, you know, the Genomi format, the JAN format keeps your hoop information as well. Okay, so that's opening a JAN file. And I do want to show you how you open the other files. So let me go ahead and kind of sneak over to my messy hard drive here. And this is, um, I guess that's in JAN too, hold on. You know, this is in Jeff format. Um, this one I know was not made in the program, it was made in a different program, but you can see it opens it up, it get, assigns the proper hoop to it, and you're ready to go, right? If you, you know, are purchasing designs like Terry's doing and just kind of customizing them, tearing them apart, then, um, you know, you can open any home format. Um, hold on one second. Terry's asking if she has version 3, if it's the latest one. Yes. If you're, I'm actually working in the Genomi version, but if you go into help and about, you know, 3, and this one's on K. And, you know, just double check. Your Elna version may be a little bit different. So, so anyway, so we've got our design open, and I'm going to mute us for one second, and I'll be right All right, sorry about that. Okay, here is my, you know, Jeff format design. And, you know, I've opened up the design, and let me show you the basic editing that you can do. You know, this is where that sequence chart comes in handy. And let me see if I can pull this out and pull the color chart out of the way. Here's my sequence chart. Can you guys see that on the screen okay? Yep. Okay. Um, Never sure because the controls are here. So, you know, if I want to select the brown color and, you know, make maybe blue gingerbread, I just click on the color chip. You know, if I want to change it to just a, you know, different color brown, I just click on the color chip. Um, the view that you're seeing right now is in Visualizer. This is your 3D view. Okay. Okay, if I turn it off, Okay, this is what your regular work view looks like. When something is selected, it's, you know, selected and highlighted magenta when you are in your regular work view. So, if you, you know, working in the program and all of a sudden things turn like, you know, this beaming pink and you can't get rid of it, it's because it's selected. If you click off to the side, you should be able to deselect it. Okay? Here's all the colors that are in the design in the stitching order. 
And you can see as I click on them how they highlight, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. If you want to see how something's going to stitch, you have a slow redraw option, which is this flower. When you click on the little slow redraw, you get this little control panel. And you can, you know, kind of drag it and see how it's going to stitch. Or you can play it like a VCR. And, you know, there's your play button. Here's the pause button. You know, there's the stop button. This is going to be your back to start button. And you can control the speed by using this slider. So if you want to go at warp speed, you go all the way over. And if you want to kind of slow down to see what's really going on, you just pull it more to the left. Auto scroll is used when you would be zoomed in like this. And if you select auto scroll, what's going to happen is as it, you know, see my screen scrolling as it kind of, you know, moves around to the different sections mm -hmm. of the design, that's what auto scroll does. And I'm going to go ahead and stop this. So that's your, you know, kind of replay so you can see what's going on. Okay, this is your zoom toolbar next to the visual, you know, visualizer. And then, of course, if you had an image, your image could be turned on or off or your grid or your hoop. The zoom toolbars work like this. You can say, okay, I want to go to 50% and just select it numerically. You can select the zoom in and it's an instant jump. You can zoom out and it's an instant jump. If you want to zoom in around something particular, you use the keyboard command and you just press the letter B. You don't have to hold it, just press it. And then press and hold the left mouse button and drag around a specific area. And that's your controlled zoom. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? And I'm going to go back in 3D. You can work in 3D in the program, which I, I like to work in 3D because I'm a visual person. And, um, you know, every once in a while that magenta just kind of is just way too magenta for me, right? But I think <laughs> most of us kind of like to work in 3D because you, know, you can see what's going on. And it's kind of an instant gratification thing. Now, with that being said... When you're looking at this in your visualizer view or your 3D view, bear in mind this is a preview. And while it may be fairly accurate, always test stitch because, you know, until they can actually put thread on the inside of your monitor, this is a preview. There's a lot of variables. There's your backing. There's your fabric. And, you know, of course, there's going to be your thread and the stitch setting. So use this as a guide, not as, you know, this is exactly how the design is going to look. Okay, and um, sometimes when you stitch things, like when I look at this on the screen, you know, I would kind of be wondering, you know, gee, is this going to show here? You know, see these little lines? Uh -huh. Okay, don't, don't think that they're going to show. Do a test stitch because what you see on the screen a lot of times is going to display some compensation. It's going to display what's called... Um, your overlap compensation where areas kind of meet, you know, when things stitch and they kind of overlap a little bit in a section. So you're going to see all of this displayed on the screen, but that doesn't mean that it's actually going to show when you stitch the design. All right? Mm -hmm. So always do a test stitch. And um, Linda, you probably have heard this one before, and I really do wish I could remember who said this, but the best statement I ever heard was this. There are two kinds of embroiderers, the ones that test stitch and the ones that wish they had. <laughs> and, you know, even I've been doing this for years, and every once in a while, you know, when you get just a little cocky and you think, eh, I know what I'm doing, I don't need to test stitch, sure enough, there's something that I would have changed had I test stitched first. Exactly. And even if it looks okay in the back, you know, because basically we all know our mistakes, right? In the back of my mind, from the day that thing is done stitching until the garment finally falls apart, I will look at it and think, oh, I should have done this, you know? Right, right, right. And, you know, that few extra minutes and that little bit of thread wouldn't have cost me that much. So, okay, now we've got our little design on the screen. And I'm going to go ahead and zoom out a little bit so you can see a little bit better. And, you know, you're probably wondering, how do you select this thing? Like, maybe you want to rotate, maybe you want to, you know, do some things. Well, down here is your select icon and it's just a little pointing finger and you click on it and you can kind of come around here and grab sections okay now bear in mind this is a pre-digitized design this is a stitch 
design. It's not made in the program. It was made in another program. So when I drag around something like this, I'm going to select bits and pieces. You have to be accurate if you want to like bump off one of these guys. You know, it might take you a couple of times to get the complete, um, you know, to get rid of the complete little gingerbread guy, right? But you can delete things. Now, my favorite button, of course, is undo. And I can undo a whole bunch of things, right? Um, mm -hmm. Undo and redo. Okay. Down here, if I have something selected, and I'm going to left click and drag all the way around everything to select it. So I can select everything by dragging around it. You know, press and hold my left mouse button and drag around it. Or I can go up to edit and select all. Then I can begin to rotate this. Here's my rotate. I can mirror it. Or I can, you know, go up to edit and group it. And why you would want to group something is this. These guys are not technically grouped, right? They came in as one design, but I might, you know, accidentally, like, move some of the eyeballs around or something, right? Or a piece of it around. So if I group it, it becomes one piece. That makes it easier to move around and manipulate. Like, I can now left click a second time on it whoops and you see I get a different box here's my regular left click right if I left click a second time I get a box with opened squares and in the center is this little you know round dot and then these little diamonds on the side or the top and the bottom right well this allows me to rotate and to me, this is much quicker than using some of the rotate tools because do you see the guidelines I have on the screen as I'm rotating? Mm -hmm. They are very easy to line up with the grid on the screen or, you know, just by looking at the lines to make sure that they're straight. And I can line this up. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off the hoop. So now this little dot right here, is a pivot point and for the most part it's in the center right but if I were doing something like flower petals and I wanted to control how this pivoted I just press and hold the left mouse button and drag that little pivot point and I can rotate it and you can see it's pivoting from the hand where I moved that point can you see that instead of pivoting from the center right here I moved my little pivot point down here. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yep. Okay. Terry, can you see it okay? Okay. And when I go to pivot now, it's going to pivot from that point. So if I happen to be making like eight flower petals and they're exactly the same flower petals, right? There's, I can copy and paste and I can just pivot them into position using this feature. Okay, let me go back and undo, undo. Okay, so those are the basics of kind of selecting group and move. Now, one thing you need to know about grouping is if I have something grouped and I happen to click on one of these colors, you see how they're all outlined in blue? If I select another color, everything changes because it's grouped. So if you oh, okay. want to make changes to a color or you want to delete like maybe the red or the green, you have to come back up to edit and ungroup. Then you come over here and say, okay, he doesn't need those red buttons. Those cinnamon things after a while make your tongue burn anyway, right? <laughs> so, you know, group and ungroup. Um, group is a great feature because it keeps everything together. Ungroup, you need to, you know, ungroup when you want to get rid of something. Okay, now... If you lose your sequence viewer over here, because I find this to be one of the most useful tools, which Linda knows from the other webinars, but, mm -hmm. you know, you just grab things so quick here. If you happen to lose that, down here is a nifty little icon that lets you turn it on or off. Okay? And we're not going to cover these, but these are layout icons. Like these two right here, we're not going to cover, and this combined, we're not going to have time to cover. But, you know, they are um, layout icons for that large layout that I was showing you. 
And of course, these are your mirror and flip and, um, you know, rotate icons. Okay, now, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the gingerbread guys, and I want to open up a design because I want to show you these nifty things here. Well, I'll show you the gingerbread with the gingerbread guys on um, this one. Let me turn my hoop back on. And I am going to go up to Edit, Select All, and I'm going to group these guys again. And then rotate them around, and I'm going to move them out of position. Because every once in a while when you open up a design, because of the way the design was saved or the format the design was saved in, uh, it opens up something like this. And, you know, if you've got all those little pieces, what ends up happening if they're not grouped, which they're not when they come in um, generally, you end up kind of accidentally moving things around. So there's this nice little feature, you know, edit, select all, and group. And then there's a quick little feature like this one. Centers everything immediately. And what's nice is see that wireframe? If it isn't what I wanted, then I just press Escape and it doesn't do anything. But if it is what I wanted, then I press Enter and it has perfectly centered my design in my hoop whatever hoop is selected. So, you know, that's kind of a nice feature, especially if you want to make sure something is centered. Because this program and many others will let you, you know, take a design and move it to, you know, like the far end of the hoop, right? Uh-huh. And it's not centered. And yes, your template's going to print in, the, you know, you can use the template, but, you know, sometimes just having the design centers, you know exactly where it's going to go, right? Right. So that's what the center feature's for. Let me go ahead and I'm going to press escape and open a new design. And I'm not going to save that. Um, but I do want to open up one of the built-in designs. Maybe I can use one of these. Oh, we can use the lace. This is actually from um, one of the lace cards, by the way, from Elna. Let me zoom out here. Okay, there's my lace design. It opened up to this small hoop because, you know, obviously it would fit into that small hoop, right? I want to open up the 200 by 200 hoop. And I'll go ahead and turn on my grid just because I'm used to seeing it. And here's my design. But see if I click on it, see how I can accidentally pull things out of it. That's why, you know, it's really good to go up to edit and select all or... You know, if you're comfortable with left click and holding that mouse button, just drag around it and then group it together. Okay, that way you don't pull anything accidentally and you can also use one of the other features. I'm going to move this over to here. I'm going to go ahead and left click a second time and rotate this. Okay, now... If I wanted to make a nifty little pattern that, you know, mirrored around here, like maybe for a center motif for a quilt or maybe just, you know, a nice little lacy design. And I really don't want to have to go, you know, a copy, paste, um, left click. Okay, let's rotate this, move my little pivot point, and let's go like this. I could do that, you know, but it would take, you know, it takes some effort and adjustments. Well, what I could do is just left click on this, make sure it's grouped together, right? Because I want to select the whole design. And I can say, you know what? Oh, let's just mirror that baby. Press enter and there you go. Oh, great. How'd you do that again? Okay, let me go back and undo. Okay, there's my design. Yeah. Select it. Remember, it's all grouped together. Uh -huh. And I say, let's mirror. Ah, uh, okay, okay. And then I say, oh, yep, that's exactly what I wanted. Enter. So what I have is everything's, you know, mirrored together. And every once in a while, so you know, I think this is doing it because of the recording. But if yours happens to do this, just turn the visualizer on, turn it off, and it comes back. And there's my design. It's a pretty design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is actually from one of the lace cards. Um, Terry is asking where Enter is. It's just going to be Enter on your keyboard. And that's so, you know, you, you know, you know, to, you got the group thing, right? I'm going to kind of get rid of these two, and I'll show you another way. You have the group thing, right? Um, so enter, when you go to enter, it's just going to be on your keyboard. Now, a trick to this <laughs> is this. If this is dead center, and I go to mirror, 
this preview of all this kind of like jumbled stuff is exactly what I'm going to get. This is going to work on a grid system. Here's my, you know, four quarters, right? I can move this design all the way up here and select that mirror option. And everything is going to mirror and rotate, and basically mirror and flip, um, based on the position it's in. Okay? If I move this down to here, let me straighten this out a little bit. If I move this down to here, okay, and I say let's mirror this, see how it's relative to where that original one is? If I move it to here, then I'm going to have these on top of each other. And I'll press enter so you can see may look like there's only two of them here, but, you know, there's two on top of each other. Now, this is kind of neat when you want to do, like, a quick little kind of quilty pattern thing, right? And I'm going to go ahead and I am going to go ahead and just open another design. And we'll go through a little bit of lettering. I'm trying to remember what some of these are. These are from the Elna website. Oh, we'll go with Kite. And I'm not going to ch save the changes to that. Okay, here's my kite, and I'm going to zoom out because the program will make this as large as it possibly can on your screen um, rather than at one-to-one, -one, you know, just so you know. Okay, here's my kite. Now, if I want to add lettering to this, I'm going to come over to this toolbar. I see the little block that says lettering? Mm -hmm. I click on that block, and what I have is the lettering options and the lettering options in the junior program are going to give you these built-in fonts okay and if you I may have a couple other ones that you don't have I'm not sure if you guys have these or if they're just um, in the pro system but um, you know you do have these fonts right so you select your fonts this is your size so that you guys have an idea um, I'm working in millimeters so if you are looking in millimeters, about 25 is about a one-inch letter. Okay, so 10 is kind of small, but we'll go with um, we'll go with 15, and type in our word. Okay, now the select character option will let me select like special characters from that um, lettering set. Okay, we'll select the exclamation point and say make current and there we go and you're saying where is the lettering right well it's waiting for me to tell it where to place it so I'm gonna left click and there's my lettering okay, now if I want to make some changes to this I can left click and make sure it's selected I can double left click and it'll open up the settings or I can left click and make sure it's selected and come down here to, oh, never mind, I'm wrong. I know there's a little sheet of paper somewhere, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I moved everything around on the screen. So we'll go ahead and just double left click and it's going to open your settings. You can also get up to, you know, the lettering settings up in the menu as well. Okay, there's your lettering, right? So you can come back in here, and if you do something like I usually do and type in, you know, because Linda knows my typing skills are a little dicey. <laughs> um, if I type in, you know, like, you know, fly a bay instead of a way, you know, I can come in here and I can crack it. I can change the size. You know, maybe you want this to be a little bit bigger or smaller. You just select a new size. Um, maybe you want this to have a little bit of a slant. Or you might want it on a text path. Or you might just want to change the font. You can come back and you can make all of those changes. You can also change the fill stitch. So if you have very wide or large lettering, um, you can come in here and say, you know, I want it to be a weave fill or I want it to be an embossed fill. So you have those options with your lettering. And this is your density. It goes on a, a slider basis. I find moving like one of these little lines at a time or about a half a line is beneficial. Because, you know, if you kind of move two lines one way or the other, you know, if you move two lines to the low end to lower your density, you see it right away. If you move two ends to the top, you don't always see that. Okay? So move in small increments and see if it's what you want. 
but 100% is standard, and you can see the number changing as I slide it, right? So, you know, if you're at 100% or 101, you know, that's pretty good, right? Auto split is when you have, like, a very wide satin stitch. If auto split is enabled, it'll drop a stitch when the satin stitch gets to a certain length so that you don't have these long, stringy satin stitches in your design. If you have a satin stitch that wide, you might want to go ahead and use maybe a weave fill or an embossed fill. And I'll go ahead and select weave fill, and there's different patterns that you can use. We'll use this one. And when it says embossed fill, I want to zoom in so you can see that it's not going to actually change it from being a satin fill because the satin fill follows the flow of the letter. All it's doing is adding a pattern to it so that it, the stitches aren't too long and stringy. Okay, so you're still going to have flow with your lettering. You know, like you can see how it flows with the A. It's just going to make sure that your stitches aren't long and, and going to get hung up. Let me go down to this, and I'm going to go ahead and delete the lettering and go back in. Okay, and I'm going to type up, 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 and away. And I actually spelled that right. I'm so good. See, Linda, you're the only one in here. You're very quiet um, without the rest having speakers here. Um, <laughs> Terry's asking if there's keyboard fonts available. And there are not keyboard fonts available in the junior program. In the digitizer program, you have a whole lot more built-in fonts, and you have um, the ability to add true type fonts. Now, with that being said, Wilcom's pre-digitized letters, the lettering that's in this program, hands down, have got to be the best digitized letters on the commercial side of the market and in the home market. And what's nice is you have a fancy monogram, you have these options here, and they're all professionally done. And the difference between true type and professionally digitized fonts is, is really basically this. Um, the true type font does very well coming through the program, but you can't beat a pre-digitized font that's been digitized by uh, an embroidery professional. You just can't. Mm -hmm. Not for large letters or not for small letters. Um, they've been tested. They've been test stitched. They're predictable. You know exactly what's going to happen. And, you know, even though you don't have keyboard lettering in this, you have some very nice lettering in it. All right, so now we've got up, up, and away, and that's going to be a little bit bigger than, you know, going straight across here. I wouldn't have enough room, so I might want to maybe use one of these, you know, text pass or text orientations. And this one's just going to be a line. Like, I can draw a line, and I can tell it to go at an angle or any way I want. This would be up and down. This is going to be a freehand, any shape that I want. Like, I'm going to make the shape. And, of course, you know, here's your circle on the bottom, and here's your circle on the top. I'm going to go ahead and use the freehand option. On the freehand option, when I select that, you know, option there and say, OK, I have to come over here and tell it where I want this lettering to go. And, you know, and I can make it go in a nice little arc, or I can make it go, you know, like this, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to kind of take the little gentle sloping arc on this. When I'm done, I press Enter, and my lettering is fit to the shape I drew. Now, I might want to space my lettering. And on this one, you're going to have to kind of shrink it up, or you're going to have to draw that line a little better. In the Digitizer program, I have the ability to really, truly edit this lettering on um, a different level. Because this is kind of a basic program, I can come in here and I can make some changes. You know, I can redraw the line if I want to. Um, you know, I can go about it that way. You know, I can change my width. You know, maybe I want this to be really fat lettering. And I can change the width in that manner. That would be <laughs> extreme, but you guys get the point, right? Yep. Um, you know, so I can take a basic lettering and I can, I think I put that one at like 400%. So, you know, um, okay, now I've got my lettering added. I could add more lettering if I wanted to. You know, I could even take, if you 
look at some of those special characters that were in the lettering and double check because I think you have them but I'm not positive. You know, you have some pretty neat characters down here. And the way to find those is to go to select character. But, you know, this is kind of a, a neat letter, right? You could actually take this letter and say, you know, let's make it pretty big. And let's add it. Okay, here's the letter, right? And I'm going to pull this letter down. And, oh, yeah, you know, this is kind of nice. Let's mirror it around. Right? So, you know, don't rule out lettering as maybe decorative stuff, too. And, of course, with the lettering being this wide, see how wide that satin is? That's when you're going to go in and say, you know, I think maybe we need an embossed filler or a weave fill. And you can select a pattern for it. So, you know, don't rule out using lettering as, like, a decorative thing. Okay, now... We've added lettering, and I've gotten rid of it, but, you know, if you wanted to combine designs, then you make a bigger hoop here. It used to be that you had to copy and paste. You'd open them up, and you get a whole bunch of different designs open, you know, in the program, and you would flip back and forth between your window and, you know, kind of cut, copy, and paste, right? Well, you don't have to right. do that anymore. You just go up to, um, did you ever have one of those days? I know it's here. <laughs> There's a combine <laughs> option. Um, that's a sequence viewer. And it allows me to bring a design in. So hold on and let me see. I might, I might be telling you something wrong in this, but I'm pretty sure I can bring a design in. Hmm. I'll have to double check on that. I might just be thinking in terms of digitizer, so I'm going to apologize if I'm wrong. Insert design. There, I knew it was here. <laughs> There you go. Um, I'm just going to kind of grab one of these. We'll grab the little fish. And I can combine designs into, you know, one file. And this comes in handy when you go to that big, large layout, too. You know, you can just combine them and combine them and combine designs, right? Instead of cut, copy, and paste or, you know, jumping it through hoops to get it. But it's under embroidery and insert. Okay, the combine option is what you use for that large hoop um, layout. And that's kind of almost a lesson in itself. But um, if you do get a chance to go through the instructions, look at those, because it's really kind of neat. All right, so you guys kind of understand the insert design. You're good with that, right? And you understand uh -huh. how to do the lettering. Lind or Terry, you good with that? And there's, um, you can insert an image because you can actually do automatic digitizing. We've gone through the, the work environments. And external media, this is how you write the design. Linda, in your case, um, you're going to have to write through the exquisite program, the express uh -huh. program. But Terry, in your case, because you have the 9500, you're going to write the design either directly through the USB cable connected to your 9500 or to your USB drive on your computer. Okay, now you also have those options over here in an icon form, but one of these does something a little bit different. Like if I just click on, um, I don't have the machine connected, I use the USB key, so if I click on this little media icon, which is a card or your USB key, what's going to happen is it comes up with whatever drives are connected, whether it's a USB drive or a smart media card, and you you can click on that. If you see folders, then it's already reading them. You can just double click on the folder and select the folder where you want to write the designs. And what you say is, you know what, write, and there you go. It's written the design to your media. Now, if I go to external media and I select write design, it's going to basically do the same thing. But write designs, read and erase is going to be another story. It gives me some more options. If I'm connected to the machine, I can actually read and write from the hard drive of the machine and I can delete things. Um, you know, here's my card, right? Here's my USB key actually. I can come in here and I can say, you know, I want to get rid of this design. It doesn't need to be there. I can erase it. And yes, I want to delete that. Uh, you know, I really want to read these. So let's read these 
and see how it reads it over to, in this case, my desktop, or I could tell it which folder or drive I wanted it to read to. So you can actually pull designs off of your machine if you want, or off of your USB keys, or off of a card, and put them into whatever folder you want. It also lets you, you know, clean up maybe your USB key or your cards that are connected to your computer. All right. Do you guys have any questions so far? No. Nope. They okay. certainly are making these programs more user friendly. Yeah, this is compared to Expressive. Um, hands down, this and Digitizer are so much more user friendly. I and can see that. You'll pick up, because you have the Digitizer experience, even if you don't feel like you have a lot of it, you'll pick up Digitizer in nothing flat because you have that experience with, you know, Expressive. And, you know, there's, not that Expressive isn't a good program, it really is, but this is just, you know, this is just almost intuitive. You know, the icons are good. The layout's good. You know, even like when we had the lettering, you know, if I didn't want to go into the lettering settings, I could just change them right here. And it's real easy to understand what these are, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's just something that makes a lot more sense. There's some things that you might have to practice or look at, but for the most part, you, you really don't even have to open up the manual to figure out that, oh, this is, you know, rotate, right? Um, or yeah. how to select your colors. So, all right, Tara, you're good. I'm going to go ahead and close this, and I'm going to show you the automation a little bit because I kind of wanted to give you an overview of the program. And, um, you know, if you guys do want to continue on, so you know, I'm going to send you, you'll get an email from me and you'll get a 25% off coupon if you want to continue on and, and take the, um, you know, hour and a half webinar sessions. And, of course, okay. you know, you'll be able to access the videos online, too, and you'll get a video recording. Okay, now... If I want to make a design, I have these automatic um, functions. And, you know, Linda, for you, you have the, the other program to work with, so that's good. And Terry, you just kind of want to tear a design apart and add design. So, you know, you may not want to look at the digitizer. But if either of you really do ever decide you want to move on, the digitizer program, I really truly have nothing but good things to say about it. And... There is a cross-stitch module. Um, Linda, you know the black work designs that I had on HSN? Yeah. Those were made in the cross-stitch module that goes with this program. Oh, really? And it's very easy to do. It's on a grid. You can make black work, like real black work. You can also do a cross-stitch charge. You can take a picture. You know, it kind of it gives you a million different ways to create cross-stitch, and it's an add-on. But it's one of the... I think it's one of the better cross-stitch programs out there, and it just definitely is one of the easier-to-use cross-stitch programs out okay. there. So, Okay, now we're going to look at inserting an image. And to insert an image, you go to Image and Insert Image. Now, the program is going to give you the option of a bitmap, JPEG, WMF, or EMF. And Linda already knows my answer on image quality, but you get to kind of hear the little mini lecture, Terry. Um, a good image is a good image no matter what it is. You can have fantastic JPEG images and you can have really bad bitmap images. You can have terrible WMF images and have a fantastic JPEG. It depends on the quality of the image and the original format it was created in. So if somebody tells you, oh, you have to use just WMF files, that's not true. Um, first off, Unless you have a graphic artist as a friend, you're probably not really going to find real WMF files, which are vector format, or EMF, which is a vector format. So, you know, a good image is a good image. Um, there are a couple places that I recommend that make reasonably priced clip art for resale for digitizing. One is a place called Diddy Bag. It's D-I-D-D-Y-B-A-G. Dot com. And another is a place called clipartopolis.com. And they have kind of a mix of things. You can buy exclusive artwork. You can, you know, it depends on what you want to do. Or you can buy kind of general artwork. Or if you want something special done, you can actually email them about doing custom work for you as well. So you can also get clip art, of course, online, or you can grab clip art 
from like Art Explosion. That's probably one of the better clip art packages. And, um, you know, put it into the automation. Now, you're not going to have the manual punch options like you have an expressive unless you upgrade. Um, you're not going to have all of the fill options either, but you saw with the fish that it really is quite capable of creating a, you know, very intricate design. You're just not going to have those fancy fills. Okay, you're going to have limited fills because this is a basic program. So let me go find the images here, and I'll show you what I've got. Um, I, the program actually comes with some images, and I always just, you know, hate using the built-in um, images. Some of them are nice, although I will say that, but, you know, I generally, you know, I generally try to find artwork that kind of works for me, right? These are the bitmap files, and I will send you these images because I can. Um, I have no JPEGs in here, but you can see I have to kind of go through and see what I've got. I've got these WMF images, right? And I've got no EMF images. So let's go back to our WMF images. And the cat is a very basic image, so I'm going to show you what happens with the cat first, and then we'll move on to a little more complicated image. If I select the kitty cat, he comes into the program, and... I need to prepare him for automatic digitizing. Up here, or wherever you kind of move these icons to, right here, right? These are click to design and image preparation tools. Okay, you need to, you can use the click to design if you want, and click you have a design, or you can do some image prep. Now on the cat, when I click the image prep, it says I have two colors, and that's correct. I have the white background and the gray cat, right? So I say, okay, the image is prepped. I really didn't need to do that, but once I prep the image, you can see I have other icons open up over here, right? <laughs> Let me go back and show you. See how those are grayed out? Once I prepare the image, I always have the automatic available to me. But once I prep the image, even if it's a basic one like this, it opens up other fill options for me. Okay. Okay. So sometimes, even though it's very simple, it's worth doing it. Now, if I do the click to design, I just click on it. This little box open up, opens up, and it says, okay, what do you want to do here? If I hadn't prepped the image, it would allow me to do that. Um, it says the image has two colors. Do I want to add outlines? And... You know, the default, I'm not quite sure why they picked Vermilion as the default, but, you know, you can change it to black or whatever you want, you know, and you can always change it later, too. So I'll leave it at Vermilion for right now. And it says, do you want to add a border? Well, I'm going to show you what the border does. And we'll say, yep, let's go ahead, and at the bottom of the screen it says empty design and it's processing and processing, and what I have is, here's my design. Here's my gray kitty cat body, right? Here's the white background. This is the border in the outline color. The border is right here. When it says border, it's talking about a border section. Okay, and I deleted the border in the outline, so you can see. This section is the border. The outline, if I press B, I can zoom in in a controlled zoom, right? Here's my outline. Okay, and you can see for all of about, what, two seconds, now well, maybe maybe ten seconds um, if I weren't talking, right? You were able to get a pretty quick little design, and yeah, you might want to make some changes, like we might want to get rid of the white background, we don't really need it. Um, you know, we'll, we might have to get rid of this little piece right here, and I can just kind of click on it and delete it. These are travel lines because it had the white so it thought, you know, well, we'll travel and save you some jump stitches, right? So if mm -hmm. you do, you know, get rid of that background, you know, double check your travel stitches. These I would leave alone because they're not going to really improve, and you're not going to cut those anyway. They're too small. Uh, you might want to get rid of this border. You know, here's the border. You can left-click on it and drag it and just delete the border. And... Nobody wants to have a vermilion outline on their kitty cat, so we click on the <laughs> vermilion and change it to black, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a quick little design, and it was very, very basic, but boom, there you go. Right? So you're saying you can't change the feel on it? 
I can go into the properties. If I select a body part, like, a, you know, I'll select his head. I can go into the properties, you know, double click, right? Mm -hmm. And I can say, oh, you know, really, the weave fill. Okay, let's do an embossed fill. And how snazzy do I want that kitty cat to be? Um, here's the different patterns that you have. Okay, and what's nice about these patterns is even though these are the patterns that you have, you have all kinds of other options with them. Like you can rotate these. You can actually rotate the pattern. Okay. Okay. And if I go to parallel fill, I can change my angle here. Well, you know, I don't want everything going at the same angle, so maybe we'll make the kitty cat's head 35 degrees. Okay. So there is some op op options. Right, there's some options. Here's the dimensions. I can change the dimension of that selected area. Okay, so, but here's how I'm going to change my angle. You know, here's my fill stitch option, and I did put an embossed fill. I can even change this pattern size. And, you know, change some settings here. Here's my density setting. My stitch spacing is always going to be the density setting. Okay, anytime you see the word spacing, it means density. Um, okay. In a commercial environment, you don't hear the word density. You hear the word spacing because what they're measuring is literally the space between each row of stitching. Makes more sense to me. Right, and the reason is, um, you remember when I told you that technically there's only two types of stitches in embroidery? There's the running stitch. And there's the satin column, you know, that's it. All of this complex fill is nothing more than running stitch lines measured out or spaced out, which is where the spacing came from. Okay. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and make the kitty cat a little snazzier. And, oh, oh we're in kind of in a purple mood today Ooh. or, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe pink or beam and green. You know I love those colors, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, so you, you have those options. You can see just based on the stitch angle that I created, right, and the fill direction here, that I can create a bunch of different, you know, types of patterns. Like, if you look at that pattern right there, it doesn't really look anything like this, right? If I no, take this back to zero and maybe take my direction to zero or 90, um, you know, I'm going to get more of, a traditional look to it. So with that being said, if I change any of these angles, you know, I can get a different look to it. Okay. So you can play with these. You can play with the sizes. You can play with the spacing. You can, you know, play with, um, when I say spacing, I don't mean like the fill. I mean like the spacing here to space that pattern apart. And you can come up with some really unique fills. Okay, now that's okay. the embossed. When you have a weave fill, you have these basic patterns too. Okay? So you can always, you know, select these basic patterns. Now, something to bear in mind is if you are doing something that maybe um, is a little more open or you just don't want, you know how sometimes you get that little bump underneath the body of something from the travel stitches underneath? Mm -hmm. You can tell it to travel on the edge. And what it'll do is it'll travel along the edge of the fill. Okay, in this case, yeah. we have jumps all over the place, these little tiny jumps, so there's nothing that's going to really travel. But just so you know what that option's for. So and I'm going to go ahead and oh. say, go ahead, and there's my new fill pattern for the kitty cat's head. Terry, you have any questions? Oh, clip art topless. Okay, I'm going to type these in. Clipartopless.com is one of them, right? And diddybag.com. Those are two sites that have all kinds of different clip art. Um, and you can spend anywhere from 80 to 40 to 10 to, you know, they have free samples. Um, 
Diddy Bags may be a little bit more reasonable. I think she has like five dollar sets, and and she's actually a little more accessible too. If you want to ask her to do something specific, you know, she probably would do it for you. I don't know what she would charge, but um, she's just a little more accessible, I think, than Clip Art Topless. I'm not sure why. Maybe she's a little smaller company, but she's always very easy to work with. And if you talked, if you do contact Nell, is her name at Diddy Bag. Um, she has donated some clip art to some of the tutorials, so please let her know that you, you know, came over from Bertina's studio, and, you know, because I, it, it's always nice that when you, to let them know that at least they're appreciated. That's right. All right, so that was a very simple design. Okay, now, when you were picking clip art to do this for, um, I, I don't know about you, but I usually, I used to do hand embroidery, right? So I have all these really wonderful pictures and charts that I've always wanted to turn into a design, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're like me, you always tend to bite off maybe a little bit more than you can chew because <laughs> you're willing to put that work in to get what you want, right? And I think most of us do that. So when you start working in the program, don't go there because you will get very, very frustrated. It's a little bit different when you're sewing or you're doing some hand embroidery. Um, you know, with the digitizing, you have to get used to the program. You have to know where the icons are. And, you know, if you have a laptop, you really could physically pick it up and toss it out the window if you get frustrated enough, <laughs> right? So don't stress yourself Sorry. out. Yeah. Now, I've been there. Um I I started about 20 years ago on this little machine called a poem. And it had a 4 by 4 hoop, and it was really like this little mini Toyota, um, Ace and May Toyota single needle embroidery machine with about two inches of clearance to get anything underneath, you know, the machine, right? <laughs> and the dealer handed it to me and said, here's the software, here's the machine, I don't have a computer, and you're on your own. And oh, I man. have a computer background. I actually have a programming background. And I I spent, like, I don't know how many hours just pulling my hair out. I was in, you know, just felt like this little, the machine's like a foot big, right? Felt like this little machine and the software had just kicked my butt. And, you know, finally, you know, things started to kind of click. And in retrospect, my first design was really pretty awful. But it looked like gold to me, right? Um, right. But I did, you know, I did the, oh, let's go make the giant house that you've been wanting to stitch forever, right, in this little 4 by 4 hoop. And, you know, so I caused myself a whole lot more grief than I needed to. Um, and I eventually just kind of ended up breaking down and, and making some circles or something like that just to keep my sanity. And then I learned a lot more, you know. there's It's a whole lot easier to learn with a few pieces than with, like, 50. So, you know, start off small, and then eventually, you know, you'll find that you kind of pick things up. And, um, Linda, you know you know Nancy Reed, right? Yes. Um, Nancy Nancy actually did a leaf on the, the one webinar. She digitized uh -huh. her leaf, but it's taken her a year to get comfortable enough to do that. And she did a really good job. I was impressed. So um, now she's cool. like the digitizing little demon over there, right? And I uh -huh. keep getting these emails from her and, and with designs attached that she's done, you know. So, but, you know, it took her a while to get comfortable. And I'm not saying it'll take you guys a year, but, um, you know, just go at your, your own pace and don't stress yourself out because you don't learn anything once you're stressed out. So, all right. Now, with that being said, we're going to look at a little more complex images. So I'm going to go ahead and go to image and insert image. And these are all kind of basic images, but some of them are a little bit deceptive. Um, you kind of go down to the WMF images. You know, this looks innocent enough, except it's got all these little lines in here, right? The moon is actually pretty easy. These, you know, they're a little pixeled out. Um, I have one, though, that I will send you this image, and I'm going to show you how deceptive clip art can be and what the kind of the beauty of the program is. Um, the program's capable of eliminating a lot of things you don't really need. All right? 
and let me go and find the folder that that's in. That's my problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I know that they're here. It's just, you know, I have so much stuff on this hard drive. Okay, now, um, here are, these are actually the images you guys will, you know, and in the digitizing thing you'll eventually end up getting if you go through the course. And then there's some other ones. Now, I want to show you something that is just so deceptive. See this little cupcake? Mm -hmm. Looks pretty simple, right? There's a little bit of imagey stuff here, and it's just a little bitmap image, right? Well, okay. we're going to look at this cupcake. And I don't need this big of highlights. Cake. Right, it's got highlights, so it's got some things going on here, but everything kind of looks like it's pretty much three shades of green, maybe four, and some white, and a couple browns, right? Looks pretty simple, right? It does. Well, this little cupcake's got 237 colors in it. Oh boy. It's like it's like a real life cupcake, you know. It's got instead of instead of calories, it's got like heaps full of pixels, right? <laughs> so, you know, what our eye see is a blended image. Okay? Like when you look at this, it's, you know, we're not seeing all of this stuff in here, right? Um mm -hmm. The computer does. The computer is going to pick up every little variation, every different pixel. Our eyes just kind of blend them together. And, you know, so obviously I'm not going to want to do 237 colors. Well, the image may look great if I say, you know, go ahead and put in 237 colors. That's 237 thread changes. <laughs> okay? And I'm dedicated to embroidery, but not that dedicated, right? So right. you have to kind of decide what do you want. Well, you know, the default, I'm going to go ahead and cancel this because the program comes up with a default. Is this default acceptable to you? You know, is six colors enough? Do you need eight colors? You know, do you want ten colors? How many thread changes do you want to do is what it comes down to. And how much detail do you need? All right. But, you know, this one, I'm going to go ahead and say, and we'll, we'll drop it back down to eight colors. I'm going to try to simplify it because, you know, this is the basic program. It's going to kind of give me the quick, you know, here you go. And I could do the quick little, let's get a design, or I can have a little more control with these tools up here. Okay, these are auto trace tools. They call them click to parallel fill or click to, but they're, you know, technically they're out of trace. What it's going to do, um, yeah, Terry's asking me, sorry, I missed your question, Terry, earlier. Terry's saying she gets emails from Dover, and are they good? I like Dover clip art, but here's going to be your problem. Most of Dover clip art that's very colorful is going to be heap, heaped full of pixels, so you're going to need a more advanced program like Digitizer to be able to create those. They have beautiful images, but, you know, they're generally kind of scans of an older image. So, you know, they're going to have a lot of different pixels in it, and it's going to be a lot of cleanup that you don't really have the editing tools in this program to do, or you don't have the manual punch tools to do. But if you look at some of their, like, black and white stuff or some of their more simplified things, those are great. Um, there is a package that you can buy uh, online. It's from Nova Soft, or you can get it at um, like Staples or Office Max or Office Depot. It's called Art Explosion, and it comes in different levels. And that is probably some of the cleanest clip art I've seen. And like I said, you can go to Diddy Bag, or you could go to Clip Art Topless. Okay, so here's our cupcake. We've reduced the colors. And what I do with these tools is very simple. I'm going to select this tool, and I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to basically click on the green section. And it just filled it in, okay? And you try to do this in an organized fashion and click on the same color green, right? And then maybe you come down here and you get this green color, and you try to be organized about how you do this, right? And if you have trouble, like I'm having trouble selecting this green section, turn off your visualizer and go in here and, you know, select it that way, okay? And if you still have trouble, you might have to zoom in, because basically it's where your mouse is pointing. 
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use the B key to zoom, and then I have a little more space to work with, okay? Mm -hmm. But see, that's all I'm doing is clicking on it, and then I can go into my property settings and I can tell it what I want to change, you know, what type of fill do I want in this. And let me go back to Visualizer, and there you go, I have a design pretty quick. You know, I didn't do all of it, but, you know, you guys get the idea. I'm going to change my fill directions. I'm going to change the fill type. Um, mm -hmm. These green sections down here, I might want to get rid of the darker green sections, and I might say, you know what, let's do, um, you know, I guess we're going to do, I was thinking we had a satin tool, but this is going to be clicked to center line. So we would use the we fill and then change it to satin. So let me double click on this green. That selects all the green, right? Double click on it and say, you know, let's make this a satin fill. And then you're going to change your fill direction so that that satin looks good. So, you know, it's going to simplify a more complicated image. You can, you know, like the fish, you have to get an eye for the images that are going to work in here. Okay, like this one, I would really, you know, this cute little cupcake, and yeah, it worked out okay. But, you know, I would probably be telling you, oh, punch this in digitizer. Because you have a lot more control, you can get a lot more highlights, you can handle more of those colors. But you'll get an eye for what works because, you know, if you saw the fish, well, you saw the fish earlier, right? Right. That's just a basic clip art image. Um, and it, what was nice about it was I, you know, it had like multiple colors. I'm going to see if I can find the actual image to show you what it looks like because it's not a perfect image to use for this. But the colors were like two shades of purple. So when I reduced the colors, they reduced well, you know. Not everything's going to reduce well. Like you're not going to scan something in at 600 DPI and have all of those pixels in it and expect to be able to reduce that, sim you know, in a simple form, okay. And even for, you know, embroidery, you never want to scan that high. You know, if you have to scan that high to get detail, it's time to take your tracing pencils out, right? But 300, 150 DPI, yeah, you might be able to use something like that. You just have to watch how many pixels and how many different colors are in the image. But you'll get an eye for that once you, you know, kind of go through that. And let me see if I can find that image real quick. Sometimes they kind of hide on my hard drive here. Okay, it's going to be in this folder, I believe. Here we go. And let me turn you guys back on. All right. The original image is right here. No, this one. Hold on. Okay. There. That's the original image. So you can see it's not really a clean image, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, I reduced. I reduced the colors. I didn't it didn't pick up all of these colors because it reduced it. It didn't pick up the three or four shades of gold here, it reduced it. Or the purple or the you know, so there but you can also look at this and see that it's a pretty clean image. You know, so you're gonna get kind of an eye for what works. And it's not just this program, it's really what works in automatic digitizing, because not every image will work in automatic digitizing. Um, for example, this will not work in automatic digitizing. It looks nice and clean, but it's just really too busy. Okay, I'll get something from automatic digitizing, but I won't get what I want. I'll have so much more editing to do that I might as well manual punch. Does that make sense? Yep. So, you know, get an eye for, for, you know, an image and be realistic about what you can do with this program. Now, can I do this in digitizer? Certainly. You know, but digitizer is also, you know, and you can do this in expressive, you know, but you have the manual punch tools and you have that combination of automation and the combination of manual punch, okay? So you guys have any questions? Terry, any questions?
You guys are good? There are a lot more functions to this program. So, um, you know, we do have like three little classes that cover the basics of the program and, and a little bit in depth. And we actually go through and pretty much make a project. Um, I think that you learn more when you have something at the end of it. Or at the very least, you feel that the stress involved in learning a new software program was worth it when you could stitch a design, right? Right. So, you know, you will get a little email from me where you can, you know, go ahead and get a little discount on those if you want to go through it. Um, Linda, you have, I know you went through the Expressive videos. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it might be it might be worth exploring this, or you know, you might even want to look at the digitizer system and, and see if that's something you know that you want to look at. Well, it might be a nice little addition, you know, for doing quick things and stuff. I can see where I I might enjoy using it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely good for layouts. Now, um, one of the things about well, you have the multiple hooping. Um, uh huh. This one is going to let you do a two-position hoop, and I just turned on the hoop for Terry called a macro hoop. Now, the macro hoop is, you know, a, a two-position hoop. Let me kind of zoom out a little bit further. If I wanted to make a design and, you know, be able to stitch it in this 11-inch hoop, I have to follow these rules. Not that I can't, you know, kind of break up a design. I can, you know, not so much in this, but I could maybe make it in pieces here. Or I could bring in different pieces of a design, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's rules that you have to follow. See these guidelines over here? Here's the blue and there's the, you know, red outlines. Mm -hmm. This piece has to fit within the red lines. Okay. Okay, so it's got to fit in the red lines. I'll turn off the image. But, you know, the design itself has to fit into the red lines. Okay, can, even though this blue overlaps, it, that's like an overlap area. So, I can take, you know, the second part of the design, and we'll go all fancy here. And as long as it fits into the blue area, this section where these two hoops overlap is an overlap section. And what would happen when I sent this out to the machine is, you go ahead and click on the machine, and what it's telling me is that they have to fit entirely into the hoop. Okay, when you get this message, you have to kind of look. And I can tell just because I'm used to it that it's down here. I didn't kind of stay in that blue line, right? Mm -hmm. When I write this out, it's going to look at the best way to split this particular design. And it's going to write it to your card or to your machine in sections. And it's just kind of taking a second to think about this. I'm not sure why. Um, sometimes we have a little bit of issue with the webinar recording and the computer. There we go. Okay, now, you know, you're going to select your folder or, you know, you can right click here and you can make a new folder. Okay. And then you can write it. Okay, now I'm going to show you what it actually did. So, you kind of understand how it, it's going to break up this design. Okay, this is, you know, my folder, and okay. here's my design. Okay, when you look at this, you're thinking, um, it didn't do anything. Well, really, that's not true. It broke it up so that this section, you know, even though, um, you know, this is one section, it broke it up so this is going to stitch first in the one position, and this will stitch second in the two position. So when you put it on your machine, even though it looks like it's just one design on your card, you go back mm -hmm. to the card, the machine is seeing the information in this design that says, oh yeah, you got to move that hoop. And it's going to stitch one of them, and then it's going to stop, and it's going to say, slide the hoop to the second position. And you just slide the hoop up. And if you have a very complicated design, you might want to have your printed templates and double check the alignment and adjust it if you need to, you know, because sometimes the fabric pulls, and then stitch that second section to the design. And that's how you use this macro hoop. Okay. And um, for you on the multiple hooping, you know, you're going to have to use the expressive software in the machine. And, mm -hmm. okay, Terry's asking if they'll meet... Um, yeah, on this particular design, because I was lazy and didn't basically, you know, edit it much, right? 
they would definitely meet and overlap here. So I'll get a little more, you know, specific here. How's that? Let me get the, oh, yeah, that's right. It's a Jeff design. I'm thinking, why is this not doing what I want? It's because I opened the stitch file. Okay, so let me just get rid of this. Okay, now I would stitch like this. I would have the gap. Or, you know, if I really wanted them to touch, I could go like this. And, you know, it's like anything else. When you're making a design, you might want to overlap just a little tiny bit because you know there's going to be some pull. And you're going to print your templates because you're going to use these to line up um, the first, not only, you know, like the first design, right? Here's your first design. You're going to use this to line up the second design. You can see here's my templates, right? You're going to tape these all together and have this big giant... Um, you know, layout, right? Yeah. And, but you're going to use this to double check the placement of that second design too, in case you have to adjust, in case there was a little fabric pull, you know, and that way you know they line up. Let me go ahead and close this out. And so, yeah, if we did it the original way, it would have been pretty bulletproof because they were just overlapping each other. But, um, you know, of course you would edit, and if you were adding a design, I would honestly overlap a little tiny bit here. Not much, just a little bit, because more than likely you're going to end up with a little gap, and that's why you really do need to maybe overlap a little bit and use those templates. Okay, Terry, do you have any other design, or any other design, any other questions?